thank you for being here today. That, absolutely right. You could be a lot of different places, but uh, thankful that you're here to be a part of this, and uh, we will uh, we will wrap this up uh, as, uh, as tightly as we can here at the end, and uh, make sure that you get out of here uh, on time. But uh, just appreciate the opportunity and just your interest in your interest in the Lord's work is. Uh, it's just such an encouragement to me um, that you want to that you want to talk about it, and that this congregation, you all are blessed in this congregation uh, tremendously. You've got a great family here. I'm just thankful that we get to be here for a couple of days with you. Uh, if 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 Jesus were to come 2023, and he were to tell parables to say the kingdom of heaven is like, but he was to use modern day metaphors to talk about this church. What would he use today? I mean, he used a lot of things in the first century that they understood, and he chose the right things because we still understand those things today. But are there any modern day metaphor? You know, the kingdom of heaven is like a car. I mean, could could, could you take a car and, and talk about the different intricacies or a taxi? You know, I'm talking about the different intricacies of a taxi. And say, you know, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. I don't know. You know, the kingdom of heaven is like an airplane. The kingdom of heaven is like the internet. Uh, you know, and have some some sort of uh, things that could come out of that. The kingdom of heaven is like sweet tea. Uh, you know, I mean, could you figure? I don't know. But Jesus chose things people understood. A car, an airplane, the internet, sweet tea. I mean, he chose things people understood and said, here's what my church, here's what my kingdom is like. One of them is, he said his kingdom is like a vineyard. Vineyard. You think about the different places in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1 where he tells a parable about the landowner who went out in the early morning to hire laborers to work in his vineyard. Okay, you think about Matthew 28, um, or verse, Matthew 21 and verse 28 where it talks about the man who had two sons and he said to his first son, go today and work in my vineyard. And then you get down uh, about uh, five or six verses later tells another parable about another landowner who had a vineyard. What's the point? Point is, he wants us to see the church as a vineyard. Why, why a vineyard? All, all the metaphors that Jesus used, he used to try to give us an understanding of what the nature of the church is like. And he gave us different perspectives. He talked about the church being a, uh, a body. Well, what is, why does he call the church a body? Well, because there's different parts to a body and they all function together for the, for the good of the whole. He talked about the church as a kingdom. Well, the church has a has a ruler, has laws, has boundaries, has citizens. Well, that's, that's kind of what the church is like. And he said the church is like a flock. Okay, so here we have sheep who are aimlessly wandering, but they have the shepherd to guide them and to show them the way. The, the church is like a family. What's that about? Oh, well, we, we all have these close, intimate relationships with each other. We're all bound together in one family. Oh, that's what the church is like. It says the church is the bride of Christ. What's that? Oh, because there is that there is that that unique entity, that unique intimate relationship that only exists between a husband and his wife. That bond that they enjoy, and there's a faithfulness that is to be there. Okay, I, we can get that. The church is like an army. He says that you know we go out. There's battles that we're facing, but we've got to defend the truth. We got to stand for the truth. You, I mean, you, you think of the metaphors. There, there's more. That, there's more than that. But what's the purpose? Church has a lot of different perspectives. A lot, it's got this nature to it. We we grab a hold of it. So the church is a vineyard. What does that mean? Church is a place that requires labor. Church is a place that requires real work. We talked about that a little bit in the matter of evangelism. But when Jesus talks about the church as a vineyard, he's not saying, "Hey, we need all these people to come in and just sit by, uh, sit down in the vineyard and watch everybody else working." No, the church as a vineyard involves. Everybody in the vineyard working for the good of the vineyard and for the good of the land owner. And so we're all working together for the good of the church, for the good of the owner of the church. And so as we talk about being involved in the work, I want to share just some thoughts with you. And the first is, I just want to talk about a description of what this even is talking about, working in a vineyard. You've got you got these metaphors that tell us about the church. Well, there's similar metaphors that talk about us as individuals. Individual Christians are not just called Christians. You know, I'm a child. That gives me one perspective. My God, I'm a servant. Okay, that's another perspective. I'm a citizen in that kingdom. I'm a sheep. I'm a, I'm a soldier. So a lot of those metaphors come to me personally. 
So, in the metaphor of the vineyard, what am I? Turn, turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to look at it, just a few verses here to talk about this description of what the work of the church is and how we are all involved in this. And when you get over 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I love the expression in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 that's in the Old King James. Um, I think it's the Old King James that, that says that we are laborers together with God. I love that concept. Here we are in this vineyard, and in this vineyard we are all laborers in this vineyard. We're all laborers together. We're all laborers together with God. So I want you to think about each, each part of that. When we are in the church, we are described here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as being involved in labor. In, what does that mean? We're, we're involved in hard work as, as a part of the Lord's church. Look at verse 5. Paul says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But the New King James says, but ministers. Your translation might say, but servants. Here I am in the church. What am I? I'm a, I'm a servant. I'm somebody who works. Look at verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered. Verse 7. He who plants, he who waters. What's that? There's work that's involved in here. And so we are servants who are involved in these various labors of planting and watering. You get down to the end of verse 8. The last word I have in verse 8 of my Bible is the word labor. The reward according to his own labor. So we have servants planting watering. Planting watering in verse uh, in verse 7 are present tense verbs which indicate an ongoing activity. you got the word labor at the end of verse 8. So what we are involved in, and I meant to put all of that up there uh, a second ago, but what we are involved in is not just sitting by and watching. Not just sitting by and being an observer of other people engaged in the work. The work, the, the, the place that God has for us in the church is a place of work. And, and we know that. We know that we know that from other passages in Scripture where, where the Bible says in Ephesians 2, we are his, the church, the members of the church, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's I have been created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. That's why I'm there. I was when I was saved, I was added to his body, to his kingdom, I was added to his church. Why? I am there for good works. And so he calls upon us to be always abounding in those good works. It's not just a Sunday thing, not just a convenient thing, not just when I have time thing. It is an everything thing. And so when Jesus says in Matthew chapter nine, the harvest is plentiful. A ton of work, there's a ton of opportunities at the labors are few. That's us. There's not enough of us to do the work that needs to be done. And so what did Jesus say in the next verse? Pray the Lord of harvest that He will send forth laborers. And whenever I read that verse, whenever I talk about that verse, I'll always say, we need to pray that, and then we need to go and answer that prayer. Lord, send more laborers into your field. Amen. Okay, Lord, I volunteer. I'll be one of those laborers to go into your field and do the work. So when we're talking about getting everybody involved in the work of the church, first thing I want to see is, yes, there's work. It's labor. But what's the second thing that's involved here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? We are working, we are laborers together. When the Bible says the Lord added unto the church daily those who are being saved, it did not say that the Lord added into isolation those who are being saved. The Lord added into a into a place by themselves. No, he put us in the church. He didn't put us off by ourselves someplace. We get to be a part of a church that is full of other workers, that we are not in isolation. Look at verse 8, where he says, He who plants and he who waters are one. It's not just, oh yeah, there's that guy over there, and he, he does the planting. Oh yeah, there's that guy over there, he does the watering. But you know, they, they're two different guys doing two different... No, 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 no. Those two different guys might be doing different things, but they're all involved in the same work together. They are one in their efforts for the Lord. And we need to remember that as we, as we go through our effort. That we're, not, we're not in this by ourselves. We talked about evangelism in the last hour. We're, we've got each other to lean upon. You know, we were, we were talking afterwards about the fact that not everybody is as skilled to teach somebody else as, as another person. You know, and, and obviously some people are better at, 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 uh, at sitting down and opening the Bible and teach somebody. But what, what, I'll, what I'll tell folks at, at home sometimes, look, if you'll get a study set up, and you don't feel comfortable doing it? Call me. I'll be, and you know, and we'll sit, we'll study with them together. 
But you know, don't feel intimidated so much that you don't feel like you can do this. Let's do it together. Because, you know, or call somebody else, it doesn't have to be me. Call somebody else in the church and, and do it together. Because that's the nature that we're involved in a labor, but we're involved in the labor and, and involved in it together. I love Philippians chapter one, verse twenty seven, where Paul says, Here's what I want to hear about you, that that you're that you're in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That expression striving together literally means they're side by side. Uh, you know, they're they're not they're not distant from each other. They're working alongside of each other. I pick and when I picture that, I picture an army walk in, in the old you know Roman days with their shields side by side, advancing advancing their front. How are they doing? Because they're all side by side, uh, striving together. What are we striving? We're striving together for the faith of the gospel, and so that's our responsibility. We, is, is, is to not just say, well, I've got this work. I've got labor together with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can do more as a team together than we can do separately. Amen. That's the nature of the church. If He just put us in isolation, I'd be all by myself and think it's all on me. But when the load is on all of us together, we're able to do more. I, I know you've heard this illustration but it, it just it impacts me every time I think about it. That, that it is said that a draft horse can pull 8,000 pounds of load. That's four tons. I mean, how much can you pull? I mean, 8,000 pounds? So you, you take a draft horse, you hook him up to a trailer, you put 8,000 pounds, that, that horse is going to pull 8,000 pounds. You take another draft horse, you put him over here, you hook him up to a load of 8,000 pounds, he'll pull that 8,000 pounds. But if you take that horse, you take that horse, and you put them together, and you put a load behind him. Over here, he can pull 8,000. Over here, he can pull 8,000. But they say you take those two draft horses, you put them together. Now, what, can they pull, pull 16,000? Well, of course they can pull 16,000. They say they can pull 24,000 pounds. Well, wait. Well, why can't he pull 12,000 and he pull 12, He can't do it on his own. But you put them together, and they can do more together than they can by themselves. You think God knew that? When He designed the church as a body, have all these parts working together. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where is it? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is all about talking about the body, where you have all these parts. That's what Ephesians 4, verse 16. I love Ephesians 4, verse 16, where it talks about where, when each part does its share. That, that verse challenges me when I read it. Am I doing my share? When each part does its share, the Bible says it causes the growth of the body of the edifying of itself in love. Hmm. Could the church as a whole be growing and doing more if I was doing my share. That's a challenging verse. And, but it's not all on me. I'm a laborer. I'm a laborer together with this family. But the rest of it is, I'm a laborer together with God. This is not my work. This is not something that, that I designed. The, the verse 9 is the old King James that says that we are God's fellow workers. The new King James says we are God's fellow workers. We're, we're right in this together with Him. This is His work. I want you to see what God does in these verses. Look at verse 5. Who then is Apollos? Who is, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord, first thing, gave to each one. In this work, it is God who gives us the opportunities. Your Bible might have the word opportunities in verse 5. God gives us the opportunities. Why? Because it's, it's, it's His work. Verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God's the one who gives the opportunities for us to work together. God is the one who gives the growth. This isn't ours. It's not our, our work. It's His work. He's giving us opportunities. He's the one who gives the increase. Verse 8, He who plants and he who waters, they're one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Who is he going to receive the reward from? God. Because it's God's reward to give. We are involved, we said this last hour, we are involved in the greatest work on earth. We get to be a part of it. Am I a laborer? Yes. Am I a laborer together with all of you? Yes. Greatest part of this, we get to be laborers together with God because it's His work. When I pray for opportunities, He's going to give them to me. When I pray, when I do the work, God is going to give the increase. And at the end of time, when I stand before Christ on the day of judgment, 
He will be giving the reward. Not because I've earned it. Don't get the wrong idea. Not because I deserve it. But because He's a gracious God. And so I wanted at the beginning of what we're talking about today as we think about being involved in the work of the church just to give a description from 1 Corinthians 3 about what are we doing here. We're not alone, but it's not our work either. And we need to trust in our God who's going to work with us through this. So as, as we think about the description, I want to go on and talk about an expectation that, that I think we need to have inside the work of the church. And in this section I have struggled I'll just be honest with you. I've struggled with whether I should present it the way I'm going to present it because I think you're going to disagree with some of the stuff I say. Now, I'm just letting you know. All right? I, I, you may not be on the same page here. Um, and uh, I, I want to be... I, 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 well, I'll just get into it because you're going to think, what in the world are you talking about? But uh, I, I'm just saying up front, we may see this differently, okay? What, what am I talking about when I'm talking about expectations? Uh, you know, I, whenever we've done planning in the church... My elders have always told me, because as, as long as I remember, we need to set goals, and our goals need to be smart. And you've probably done that, S-M-A-R-T, right? Your goals need to be specific. They need to be measurable. They need to be achievable. Uh, they need to be relevant or realistic. They need to be time-based, time-sensitive. Uh, you may have different words, but the same concepts for those letters. Uh, and so you've got the R. And our goals need to be realistic. So we're talking about getting everyone involved in the work of the church, right? We're talking about getting everyone involved in the work of the church. Here's where I think I want us to kind of settle down for just a minute and consider. If our goals are to be realistic, is it, maybe I should phrase it in a question, is it realistic that everyone in the church is going to engage in the work of the church. Is that realistic? Now, we want it to be. I'm not saying we don't want it to be. And, 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 I, and I, I'm not here to judge anybody who's not. I'm just saying if our goals are going to be smart, if they're going to be realistic, is every member of the church going to be involved? I believe that there are some Christians in the Lord's church who are content on coming on Sunday morning, maybe not every Sunday morning, but maybe most Sunday mornings, being here for worship, and that's the extent of their connection to the church and to Christ. And there may not be any, I'm not saying we don't try, I'm just saying there may not be anything that we can do to change them. Okay, do we consider that person involved in the work of the church? You, you, can, you can answer that question for yourself. Do we consider them involved in the work of the church? But here, here's the thing. I'm concerned that if we spend a lot, you're, don't misunderstand this, if we spend a lot of time catering to those who are not involved to try to get them involved, to try to coax them to be involved, and we neglect those who are already involved, that we may be doing a disservice. So I'm not saying don't try to get them involved. I'm just saying be careful that we don't neglect or overlook. Wait a minute. Here's a group of people that are already or want to be involved, and we're spending so much time trying to increase our numbers because our goals have to be measurable, right? So that, that's is measurable. That, no, no, I'm uh, putting too much up there. Uh, measurable is going to come. <laughs> measurable is going to come here in just a minute. But uh, but I think I think we've got to be balanced uh, in how we approach this because sometimes I think we can neglect or miss other workers by putting a lot of effort in some places where maybe there's not going to be a whole lot of fruit to get people involved. You know, the old expression says you can lead a horse to water, but all right, why, why is that such a common expression? Because it's true. We need to provide opportunities. We need to give opportunities for people to be involved, but we can't force them. We need to lead them to the water and say, here's what can, here's what can happen if you're involved, but we can't force them to be involved. And so here's, here's what I had here a minute ago. That 80-20 rule exists for why do we call it an 80 20 rule because it applies in so many different what's the that 80 percent of the work is being done by 20 percent of the people is that common in a lot of yeah is it common in congregations yes do we want it to be better yes we want it to be do we are we satisfied with 80 20 no we're not satisfied with it can we do more with god's help absolutely can we get those percentages changed 100 percent. but here's the thing I don't think we need to focus, focus, so focus solely on numbers. Ooh, that's going to bother some elders because because goals have to be measurable. And how do we measure goals? Numbers. I mean, that's 
That's how you measure whether you've reached a goal. And so if we say we, we want to get 65% of our members actively involved in a work of the church. Measurable goal. Well, are we failing if we only have 45% of our members involved in the work of the church? Oh, man. We just can't get there. What are we doing wrong? Wait, what? Why do we have to say we're doing anything? You know? Now, is, is it good to have a goal that we're reaching for? Yes. But let me ask this. Is the goal that we're reaching for just to reach the number? Just to be able to say, check, we've reached 65%. Ha, we made it. Is that our goal? Just, just to say we, we check that box off? Or is it that we want to get people truly committed to Christ, committed to His church in a genuine way where they want to be here, that they want to be a part of the family and actively involved? Are there distractions? Yes. And sometimes those distractions are what kind of lead us away from maybe the focus we need to have. I remember, I remember and just uh, along this line, that this, this story always comes to mind when I'm thinking about you know, we, we always have people that are not involved. And we, we focus on those people, are not, and we need to focus on those people that are not involved. But I, when, uh, when Tracy and I, when we first graduated from college and went back home uh, to Palmage Lakes, we worked with the youth group for, for a few years. And um, I remember one of those early years walking into a Sunday night devotional with the youth group. And uh, I, can remember, I can remember the setting, and we, we sh- we had about 30 kids in the youth group, um, high school youth group back then. So walking into a, a Sunday, we, we had Sunday night devotionals after evening services. We had them in members' homes. Uh, close, you know, so we go to members' home, have a devotional, eat there, and that kind of thing. We should have had 25 to 30 kids at that devotional because that's what we were always running for our activities and our devotions. So I walk in, get ready for this devotional on this night, and there were 13 kids there. I know because I counted. Mm-hmm. There were 13 kids. And I looked around at these kids and I said with this look on my face where is everybody? Because what did I want? Numbers. We should have 25 to 30 here. Where is everybody? And I can remember the little girl's face. 13, 13, 14. I could call her name. 13, 14 year old little girl. She kind of looked around too. And then this innocent little face, she looks up to me and she says, We're here. Oh, I said, Cut me to the heart, you little kid. Uh, we're here. That changed. And, and I didn't realize how much that changed me until years later. And it's like, Okay, did I want the 25? Yes, I wanted the, did I want the yes? I wanted the, all of them, but we've got these that are here. We've got these who are involved. We've got these who want to work. Grab them up. Use them. Utilize them. Equip them. Encourage them. Do everything. Let, let's not neglect. Do we, do we want to add one more? Yes. we want to add two? Yes. Let's add some more. Let's increase those numbers where we can. But I don't know that we need to be solely focused. There was a guy in the Bible with, with a name similar to mine that got himself in trouble with, with numbers, right? With counting. And so that, maybe that gives me a little pause sometimes when, when I think about it. But instead of focusing on numbers, and if we can do this, I think our goals need to be focused on people and focused on souls and focused on their continued growth. And so if we're going to make goals for getting people involved in the work, you you can disagree with me on this and not say we're going to get everyone involved, get 100% involved, or put a number to it. And we want to put a number to it, great, do it. But here's what I think we could do. If we focus goals on people and souls and their growth is to say, here's a goal. We want to provide opportunities for the spiritual growth of each member, and therefore for the whole church. So a goal is we want to provide uh, we want to provide opportunities for the spiritual growth. Well, what's that going to involve? Bible classes. We talked about it last night. You know, devotionals. You know, uh, Bible reading programs. Whatever whatever those specific line items, uh, action items may be underneath. Goal. We want to provide opportunities for the spiritual growth of the members. Number two, we want to provide opportunities for the not just the spiritual growth of the members, but the relational growth of the members. Spiritual growth is they're building their faith, their relationship with God. Relational growth is we want them to get to know 
each other. Spend time with each other. So goal, relational growth of the mem of each member. Action items underneath it, we, we you know, you, you fill in the blanks. But we want to grow closer together as a family. And then not just, not just spiritual goals and relational goals, but what about growth goals? What about serving growth roles? We want to provide, opp goal, provide opportunities for the, the growing, serving efforts of our members. That's different. That's different than their own spiritual faith, growing them spiritually, different than their relational. Now we want to get them involved in works and things that they can do inside, and then you fill in some blanks of action items. To me, those are goals. They may be a little bit harder to measure because they don't have a number attached to it, but I think there's a way to figure out how to measure those goals and, and how we're trying to reach and increasing the growth of our members because honestly, what does 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tell us? Is the increase, is the growth up to us? It's God who gives the increase. We just need to get busy in, in those efforts in the work. So I wanted to share just that thought with you on expectation. You may not, you may look at that and say, that's, that's horrible. We need to not have David back here to talk about church work again because he's killing us on this. Um, maybe just a seed, a, a seed for thought on expectation. Really quick. I want to talk about organization. Um, getting people involved in the work, what about organization? Whenever I think about organizing work of the church, I, I, I have a hard time not thinking about my dad way back in the day. My dad, I grew up in the congregation where I'm working now. Uh, I've known him my whole life. I was, I was part of that congregation nine months before I was born. Uh, and, and, and then and then not. So uh, my dad my dad was one of the deacons of that congregation before they moved away. And when we were in our older building, we're in a well, older. We've been in our building for 25 years. But um, when we were in the building before that, uh, it was it was a it, we had four distinct buildings. Uh, we had the auditorium building. We had the children's education building. We had a two story um, another education building. And then we had our fellowship hall. Uh, adult classes, office building, four different buildings, uh, and it, it was run down. Um, and uh, so, my one of my dad's deacon duties was painting. That was painting the building, keeping the building looking good. And uh, and so he went. It, the elders said, "We need to get this place painted." I don't know if they said it. Or my dad just said, "This is looking bad. We need to get stuff painted." And so uh, my dad went and got some quotes from painters. And you know, it's like they're going to charge this much to paint this. And my dad, my dad was as frugal as could be. He's like, we are not paying that much money for somebody to come and paint the building when we can do it ourselves. <laughs> and the elder said, "Who's this weed? You got a mouse in your pocket? I mean, who's this weed is going to paint this building? It's just huge." And, and so my dad took the challenge. He said, "Nope, we can do it." Um, and so he went and planned the whole thing. He went and purchased everything. He, he placed everything where it's supposed to be. So on this Saturday morning, I mean, they, they, they announced it big. They encouraged the whole church to come out, be a part, you know, young and old come out and be a part of the painting of this building. When people showed up on that Saturday morning, they weren't sure if we were going to get the job done on Saturday, right? Uh, they, they showed up on Saturday morning. When they showed up, my dad had everything in place. He had, he had the rollers, the paint, the brushes, and this station, this station. All around all four buildings, there were stations with every piece of equipment they would need to paint that set, whatever they were working on there. He had, uh, we had older members who, uh, you know, they, they weren't going to use a roller, and, you know, to do this number. They weren't going to get down and paint baseboards or anything, you know, but he, he had a cup of paint and he said, look, all in, we, these were uh, uh, cement block buildings that had that little gap in between the, the cement blocks. You, you guys are smarter than me, that little masonry gap in between. Um, and, and so he said, all I want you to do, take this little cup of paint, take a paintbrush, and don't bend up or down. Just paint that cement line all the way around this building. You're a little bit shorter. I want you to paint this one. <laughs> and down, but don't go up or down. Just paint this line. All He had something for everybody to do. I, and I, I'm not mentioning this to brag on my dad and say he's, I, I'm just, a, as an example, because I'm going to get to the point. Four hours later, we had painted that entire place. Uh, as, as a congregation. Uh, the newspaper folks came out, took pictures of us, we were in the newspaper the next day saying, look at this church uh, and the work that did. But the point was that he organized this when people were saying, 
had this before. It's not going to work, David. That's my dad saying, David. It's not going to work, David. And he said, no, we can do this. Reminds me of Nehemiah. That's why I'm talking about that. Reminds me of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, what? Here's these walls are torn down in Jerusalem. Well, why haven't they been rebuilt in all of these decades? Well, Nehemiah, you need to understand. This, this, this isn't going to happen. There's a lot of work involved in rebuilding walls. We don't have the personnel. We don't have, you know, whatever the excuses may have been. All right, so go to Nehemiah chapter 2 real quick. And, and I, I want you to see a verse here as we kind of capture some thoughts on organization. And we, you could spend months on Nehemiah talking about organization. But let me, let me just give you a thought here from Nehemiah chapter 2. And this thought is that good organization starts with the leadership. Good organization in the church starts with the leadership. And here we see that with Nehemiah. And when I say leadership, good organization has got to start with the elders, the deacons, and the preachers in the church. So Nehemiah in chapter 2, he comes to Jerusalem, he surveys the walls, and, and you remember the story about that? You know, he goes out privately to see what the situation is, to evaluate what's going on. Um, and verse 16 of Nehemiah 2 says, the officials didn't even know where he had gone and what he had done. That he, he was doing this just to get things. So he had heard the news, he had heard the reports, but he wanted to see it for himself. Is that, is that a good practice? You know, you hear information, but wait a minute. I need to put my own eyes on this and understand the situation myself. Verse 17 is where I want us to look. When we talk about leadership, organization, what leaders need to do. What leaders need to do is to help the members to see, number one, to see in quotation marks that there is a need. Look at what Nehemiah says, verse 17. He says to the people, you see the distress. He was going to tell them what needed to be done, but the first thing he wants them to understand is he wants them to see the need. They had been seeing it for decades. Yeah, Nehemiah, we, we, we've been living here. You're new on the scene. We know. We No, no, no. He starts out. You see the distress. Look, people. You know, behold, lift up your eyes and look concept. You see the need. Okay? Yeah, we got that. Number two. Keep going in verse 17. Nehemiah wanted the members to see the leaders were involved in this. I love the pronoun here. You see the distress that... Does he say you are in in verse 17? That would be correct because he's new on the scene, right? I haven't been a part of, problem, of this problem. I, I mean, what, what's your old problem? You see the distress you're in? What's your problem? Get, get yourselves up and get... No, 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 no. You see the distress. We, he puts himself in the equation. He hadn't been there. You see the distress we are in? Hebrews writer does that all throughout the book of Hebrews. Let us, let us, let us. Wait a minute. They're the ones falling away, not you. No, let us, let us. You didn't see the distress we are in? The leaders need to put themselves in the situation and get involved. And then the third thing is the members need to be invited into the work. You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and escape to burn the fire. Come and let us build the wall. Plural pronoun us. That we may no longer be a reproach. Nehemiah, you're not a reproach, buddy. You're, you're a cupbearer at the end of chapter 1. You're royalty, buddy. You're not a... No, I'm a part of this. And because I'm a part of this, we have become a reproach. And we need to... We need you to see the, the need. We need you to see that the leaders are involved. And the leaders need to say, hey, let's come. Let's work on this together. And so the leaders need to show up they need to stand up. They need to start up. And that's what happens at the very beginning of chapter 3. I love chapter 3. Some people might skip over chapter 3 like it's genealogies or something. But chapter 3 is fascinating to me. It's that picture of my dad putting all those stations around for people to paint the building. That's what Nehemiah did. Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren. And he began to work. The leaders stepped in. And they were a part of the work. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to be a part of a congregation that... Twice a year, we have congregational work days. And what I mean by that is we, uh, uh, before our gospel meeting in March, before our lectureship in November, we, we have a congregational work day where we ask everybody to come out, let's, let's get stuff cleaned up. You know, let's get, let's get our grounds looking better, let's get the building looking better for, for this, these events that we're having. And uh, I'm thankful that every time, you know, we're, we'll be out there working, <coughs> working out in the parking lot, eight acres, cleaning all of this up. I'm thankful every time I oversee it. Um, you know, they could be saying, look, I'm, I'm too old. We need younger guys to do this. Every time 
my elders are there doing something. Even even seventies and eighties, they're they're out there doing something. We have vacation. We have VBS work days, prep days, getting getting all the props and decorations and everything ready. You know, well that's kid stuff, right? And that, that's kid. No, we got elders that show up for our VBS prep days, be a part of getting everything ready. Well, why are they, they've got more important things to do, right? They, they're, they're supposed to be visiting the shut-ins. They're supposed to be watching out for the wayward. I mean, they, they're supposed to be involved in. They, they don't need to be out here, you know, uh, uh, raising up leaves in the parking lot. Yeah, they do. Because if shepherds are going to truly lead the sheep, they need to be among the sheep. And that's what's happening here with Nehemiah. That's what he's trying to impress upon them. And so you read the rest of chapter 3, and the leaders are involved. You're going to read the word leader, I think it's eight times in chapter 3. Uh, and then you see some leaders who are falling down on the job, uh, like the, uh, the Tekoites. Uh, but the um, point is that good organization starts with the leadership. Let, let me get, I'm going to get through these next few kind of quick. You know, you know what? I'm just going to put them up here. Um, because I... I, uh, I want to mention these, but I, I'm, I am very conscious of our time. Um, good organization identifies what needs to be done and what can be done. Um, I think a congregation needs to be careful not to try to do too much. We want to do everything in the world that we can. But I think sometimes congregations can do so much that they do so much that what they're doing they're not doing well because they're trying to do so many different things that they're spreading themselves so thin maybe they don't have the personnel the budget the time whatever it may be that they're, they're doing a lot of things but they're not doing them well building the walls around we have that's a huge project right was it doable yes and they did it did it need to be done could it be done yes but do we read about them doing more you know they built the what did they paint the walls did they plant flat did they plant flowers up on top of the wall. Did they pave the streets? I, I don't know. I mean, it, they, they rebuilt the wall. Did they, did they build Dollar Generals all inside, bring the people in? I mean, it, what were they doing? They built the wall. That's a huge project, but they focused on that project. We've got to get this done. And so I think we need to look at what needs to be done. There are some non-negotiable, some key works of the church. These need to be done. But then look at what can be done. Not every congregation can do the same works. Uh, you know, I, and I'm not talking about the works that were essential to do. I'm talking about things that are expedient. But what can be done? Um, what do we have the budget to do? What do we have the personnel to do? Uh, what is it that we have the time to do? Um, and I'll be careful in saying this, but I think leadership needs to look at and say, just because we've been doing something, and we've always been doing something, doesn't necessarily mean that we need to keep doing, and I'm not talking about the non-negotiables, the essentials, I'm talking about the expedience. If we've always been doing something, does that mean we always have to keep doing it and keep doing it the way that we are doing it? Are there perhaps some sacred cows that we need to let go in a congregation that this was great, this worked for a number of years, it's just not Exactly. We, we've done small group, and I mean small groups, not Sunday night small groups, but just divide. We're a large congregation. We're spread out over probably, uh, we've got North and South members that probably live 60, 70 miles apart from each other uh, and going West another 25 to 30. Not going very far East because we're on the ocean. But uh, uh, we don't have any members out there. But when we were spread out, so you know, we kind of got pockets of members, so we'll, we'll divide up into different groups where they have maybe a, a week of Bible study on a Tuesday night, or they look out for each other, take food to each other, and bereavement situations, and so they're very service, service activities they do. We've tried that in a lot of different ways. Um, and we do it for a while, and it's like, this isn't working. We need to revamp do something different. But there was a time where it, the, our program in that had become kind of a sacred cow. And so when we talked about this isn't working. We need to do this differently. There were some people like, what do you mean? This is the way we've always, no, this is the way we've always done it. And it wasn't working. I mean, it just, it, it, had, it had met its purposes, but there, and so it took a while to do away with that because, no, we're so devoted to this. I had a, I had a preacher call me a few months ago and he, he and one of the elders were talking about a major thing that that church is involved in and has been involved in for a long time, a major event that they do. But he said, we're concerned because we've seen a really a big drop off of this. There's not as much interest. 
Uh, we're putting a lot of time and a lot of money into this, um, but we're just not seeing the fruits of it. Uh, and he said, we're just concerned about if we do away with it, what are people going to think? Well, it's, it's, it's not something that's essential. Uh, this event that, that they were, but it's hard to let some things go. What do we need to do? What can we do? And if there's some, if there are some things that we just cannot do, that we don't, that we don't, that we don't have the reason, then, then maybe we. And my, my, my point is, let's focus in on the things that we can really do and really do them well, and then go and do them well. And if we can add something later on, yet yeah, let's keep adding on even, even after that. The other things up here are, are obvious. You got to put the right people in charge. You got to have some some information that tells the members here's areas you can get involved. We have a book. Uh, a, a, a booklet, I should call it, that lists all of the works of the church where people can get involved. It says here's a category of, let's say, evangelism. Here's things you can do in evangelism. Here's people who are in charge of these. Uh, and mark what you would like to be involved in. Here's education. Here's all these things. And so these are given to the members. They can mark off what they want to be involved in. They give it back uh, to the elders and all of that's compiled. And that's one way you have a document that just shows here's all the works of the church. But the main thing is we just got to put people to work and we put them we, we put them to work by communicating with them by telling them what opportunities there are for them by letting them know that these things are available to you to get involved in in the work of the church Nehemiah was a master communicator uh, throughout the book we need to go to the members publicly we need to go to the members privately we go publicly and that you know through through announcements through bulletins through sermons here are ways the church can get involved in various works. We go to people privately. What would you like to be involved in? There was a time period for maybe two years that we had a clothing closet uh, where we took part of our building um, and we and we took out the storage section. We made it a clothing closet that was used for benevolence purposes. We only did it for a year or two. The reason we did it is because there was a couple that came to our elders and said, we really think we should have a clothing closet. Okay. Would you be willing to be in charge of it? To do everything that's involved in having a clothing closet? You know, it's, it's easier for people to say, we ought to do this. <laughs> well, okay, great. You want to be, you want to do it? Well, not me. I, mean, I just think we should be doing it. Okay. So our elders, you know, we should have, a, we've never had a clothing closet. We had a pantry and those kind of things. You want to do it? You want to be in charge of it? You want to head it up? Yeah, we'll do it. Okay, then we'll try it. It lasted, and I, I'm being generous for two years. I think it only lasted a year, year and a half because it became a much bigger project than they had imagined. But our elders were willing to say, if that's something that you want to try, we have the resources, we the space, you know, if it fits within the scope of what we're trying to do, okay. Then, you know, we, 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 may, give that, we may give that a try, uh, if, if they don't necessarily work out. Um, very quickly, let me talk about new members. Um, I don't know if this is universal or not, but I feel like a lot of congregations don't do a good job with new members. Um, and that's hard to do because every new member is different. And they all bring a different dynamic and, and, uh, and all of that. But if we're gonna get people involved in the work, we gotta, we gotta grab a hold of our new converts quickly um, and, and get them involved. And, and, and I see it assimilation in three different areas. Let me tell you real quick. Get members, get the new members involved, assimilating them into the family. So here's here's a here's somebody that just got adopted into our family. Do they feel a part of our family? Of our family. Do they feel like they're a brother or sister? Have they been assimilated? Have they been into our homes? If somebody's in your home, they're part of your family now, right? So assimilate them into the give them a family feel. For this new church, they're not just a member. They're not just an attender. They're not an outsider anymore. They've been assimilated into the family. Second thing is to integrate them into the work. First thing is just make them feel comfortable. Make them feel part of our family. All right, they're part of the family. Now integrate them into the work. Get them involved. You're, you're not just a new member and you get to watch everybody else working. Where would you like to be involved? Our, our elders meet with our new member, our new converts as soon as... As soon as they're baptized, they give them that little booklet. Here's things you can get involved in, and we try to. We're not. We're not good at it. Don't get the wrong idea. We try to get our new converts involved very quickly, and so we want to assimilate them. We want to integrate them uh, into the work, and then we want to educate them, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So that's 
Sometimes we focus on one of those. Sometimes we focus on all three, but we don't know it, and we're just we're, we're just kind of hitting one of them at a time. I believe with new converts, we've got to we've got to focus on all three. Maybe having a deacon in charge, one deacon, two deacon, three deacon, three deacons in charge of three, because those are three. They're they're the same thing, but they're different things. We want these new members to be in our homes. We want them in our life. How do we get that to happen? We want them integrated into a job. We want them to have a task. How do we make that happen? But we also want to educate them. We want them built up in the faith. How do we make that happen? Now, all of these can work together, but they all work separately as well. Uh, and so involvement in the work of the church, I think that's key. Let me share one last thing with you, and that is normalization. So we've got a description. We've got an expectation communication. Normalization. Um, what do I mean by normalization? I think it's beneficial to just create a culture within the church of activity and involvement that this is just us. Our normalization of the church is that we are an active body of people, that we have activities, we have congregational activities. Uh, that, are, that, that we go out as a congregation, we get involved in this, or we have specific group activities for young adults, for widows, uh, for young people, for uh, you know what, whatever specific groups may be having activities. But we have all these activities. We make sure they're on a calendar. We're in the bulletin. We're announcing them. What does that do? That gives a lot of. It, it at least gives the perception. This is an active group of people. They've got a lot going on. And so if I come and I visit here, I come and I become a part of this church, wow, there's a lot of things to do here. It, 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 gives, it gives this concept that, um, that I, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of what they're doing. Maybe you have a group of Barnabases that their job is to call, if there's a widow's group, that they call other widows and say, hey, we've got this activity on, on Saturday. I hope you'll be able to come to Barnabases and just call and invite and encourage people to come and be there, then that's kind of the activity side of what I'm talking about, creating a culture just, we've got a lot of things that happen in this church. Now, let me back up and just say, that's got to be purposeful. Not just put a bunch of stuff on the calendar so we have a lot of stuff going on. Th those activities need to be, why, why, why are we doing these things? They need to be purposeful, they need to be intentional. Now, let me get to the second part about, um, about getting people involved. Um, how do you get people involved? Well, we talked about it, you didn't fill out a book and all of this. Um, but again, what about just creating a normalization of society and culture in the church that just getting volunteers is a normal part of what we do. Being involved is normal. So that announcements are made, bulletin um, posts are made that we need, we need four volunteers to do this. And, uh, you know, can, can you come and help? And so regular, regularly looking for volunteers, to, and, and so that just, whatever deacon may need some help with something. Hey, deacon so-and-so is looking for, for five people that can help them with this. Um, and then, over a period of time, you might say, hey, you know, you may not realize this, but we've got, we've got something happening in this church. We've got about 10 of our members who've been involved in this particular work. And not to praise, just to, again, to show, hey, we asked for these volunteers a while back. We, we, did you know this work's happening over here? We've got 10 of our members that have been, they, they're the ones who've created this. They're the ones, if you wonder how this was happening, it's because 10 of our members kind of jumped in and took over and were doing this. And then follow that up with, a, an announcement that just says, you know what, we want to thank those who volunteered to help with this. You know, we, maybe you weren't expecting it, maybe it was a little more than you were thinking, but you all did a great job. You know, and, and that can be anything. It, it can be, uh, you know, we've got, uh, we, our, our teenagers, they host a, a sweetheart banquet for the older folks, you know, around Valentine's Day. And just on Sunday, they say, we just want to thank the young people that hosted that uh, that that that, that, uh, that sweetheart banquet for our soul. You know that was great. Enjoyed it. You know it, it's just oh, there's activity. Oh, they, they were involved. There were two groups that were doing things. Uh, and, and so just thank Thanksgiving or just thankful. You know, thank you to this group. Thank you to those who hosted the the widows luncheon the other day. You know, you all put a lot of work into that and showed, and the widows really appreciated it. What is that? To me, that just it's a culture. It is creating an environment that, you know what? We've got activities going on. We've got volunteers. We're involved in each other's lives that it just is its who we are. And if somebody comes and is a part of it, they realize that's just who this church is. They're active. They're involved in each other's lives. The other thing I want to mention here as we finish this up is that we need to encourage being active as a Christian, even apart from church programs. 
I mentioned that we have a booklet, you know, you can check off, here's, here are the programs, here are the works that I would like to be involved in. But I believe wholeheartedly that not all activity as a Christian needs to be organized, controlled, and monitored through a church program. Um, I, church programs are necessary, but sometimes we think we've got to have a program for everything. And I think that's where we wear ourselves out, run ourselves down, and create sacred cows. Because we got to have a pro a Christian life needs programs as part of the church, but there's so much that can be done even outside of those programs. And I think the early church had some things they did as programs, but some things that they didn't do as part. You know, obviously in Acts chapter 6, you know, they created a program to take care of the Grecian widows. What about the Jewish widows? Were they being taken care of? Well, they were. Was there a program for that? I don't know if there's a program for it or if they just did it naturally. And that they had to create a program for the Grecian widows, but we were already taking care of the Jewish widows just fine before. But if that's the case, what does that show? There's a need for programs to take care of certain works of the church. But there may be other things that just happen organically. Some things that are organized, but some things that just happen. Natural. Let me, sh let me share with you, and then we're going to close. Through the book of Acts, some things that they did that may have been organized, but they may have been organic activities too. They taught in home Bible studies. They cared for the widows. They took on undesirable tasks. Who was it who carried out Ananias and Sapphira after they died? Did you volunteer? Did you check that off in a book that says, I'd be willing to carry out the dead members after they died? I mean, who did that? That wasn't, I don't think that's, that's organic. Somebody needs to do this. Okay, we'll do it. Um, they helped new members create bonds in the church. That's a Barnabas. They used personal skills to do good works for brethren. That's Dorcas. Was that a program that Dorcas was in? I don't think it was, I, I don't think it was a program. I think it was Dorcas out of the goodness of her heart that was doing good for the church. They uh, built up, commended, and motivated their brethren to keep on keeping on in the service of the Lord. They reached out to help members get involved, inviting them to activities, as Barnabas did in Acts chapter 11. They prayed for specific needs and people. They hosted brethren in their homes. They greeted guests at the door. They encouraged and mentored young people. They took care of their missionaries. Here's one you will like. They provided food for the brethren. They had casseroles or something. I don't know. But when Lydia wanted them to come into her house, she provided a place for them. They visited and supported brethren in need. They greatly helped the brethren. Somebody prepared the Lord's Supper in Acts chapter 20. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Who prepared the Lord's Supper? Somebody prepared the Lord's Supper. Somebody opened and closed that upper room. So I don't know. Somebody got there early, turned on the lights, turned on the air conditioner, opened the window for Eutychus, and got everything ready for them to meet. I don't know who it was, but somebody had to do that. They, they supported the week. What's the point? You read through Acts. Some of these are organized efforts, I'm certain. Some of them were organic. They were just works, efforts, things the church did. Just when a need came up, we're going to do this because I'm a Christian. The early church found and created opportunities for the members to serve. And whether we do that through organized programs or whether we do that several years ago, we printed up something that we keep out in our lobby. It's just called 99 things you can do for the Lord without a program. You can come up with 199 things. But, you know, it's just, we want you involved in programs, yes. But I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God 24-7, 365. That's outside of a lot of church programs. And, and obviously, there's a whole lot of things you can do uh, more than just those 99. And it may be that, that uh, you're an older, more mature Christian and you just need to invite some younger Christians to go with you as you serve the Lord and to kind of bring them up and mature them and train them, not as a part of the program, but just as part of an effort to say, you know what? I want to create a family atmosphere. I want to get them involved and I want to help them to grow in their efforts to serve the Lord. There's a whole lot that could have been said as we talk about working uh, together as being labors together with God. But I hope some of this maybe has sparked some thoughts about some things that can help you here. And uh, I appreciate you all being here today. You've been sitting for a long time. You've been listening for a long time. 
Thank you for being here. Thank you for your encouragement.